it appeared at a moment when science and revolution seemed to make all things possible, yet the societies which emerged were riven with tension, destructiveness, menace. It struck the resonant frequency of modern times. Now, it's not a Gothic horror story. Neither is it properly science fiction. It is a speculative morality play. Above all, it's a novel of alienation and itself a written book. And it was written by a 19-year-old girl. Not that you'd know that from this first edition of 1818. Not until 1831, when Mary Shelley revised it, did it carry her name. The publishers expressed a wish that I should furnish them with some account of the origin of the story. How I then, a young girl, came to think of and dilate upon so very hideous an idea. Her book is really three stories in one. The narration begins with Walton, a man possessed. In the Arctic, he encounters Frankenstein, who takes up the tale to be displaced by the monster Frankenstein himself has created. A book of many voices then, all of which are ultimately Mary's own voice. I am by birth a Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. My ancestors had been for many years councillors and syndics, and my father had filled several public situations with honour and reputation. Monsieur Victor Frankenstein, citizen of Geneva, one of the great city-states of Europe. Mary focused her novel on Geneva, its lake and the mountains. When she was 19, her own life had come to a focus here. In the summer of 1816, Geneva offered asylum to perhaps the most remarkable bunch of exiles and misfits England has been fortunate enough to own, or disown. Two of England's greatest poets and two of her greatest heretics, Lord Byron and Percy Bysshe Shelley. With Shelley was the young girl Mary who ran away with him in 1814. And her half-sister Claire, besotted with Byron, came too, to become a permanent fixture in the Shelley household. Here at Byron's villa, Diod Jati and down there in the Shelley's place by the lake. They spent a wet and windy but happy summer, endlessly writing, sailing, walking, sharing their souls and perhaps more. While across the water, English tourists trained avid telescopes, hoping to catch a glimpse of group sex or even other abominations. Incessant rain confined us to the house and some volumes of ghost stories fell into our hands. We will each write a ghost story, said Lord Byron. I busied myself to think of an idea, but felt that blank incapability. Then during one of the conversations, the principle of life was discussed, and whether there was any probability of its ever being discovered. Perhaps a corpse would be reanimated. When the witching hour had gone by and I placed my head on my pillow, I did not sleep. My imagination, unbidden, possessed me. I opened my eyes in terror, but swift as light was the idea that broke upon me. I have found it, my ghost story. The story she found was to capture the world's imagination and hold it captive for nearly 200 years. She focused it on the Frankenstein she invented. And how unlike her own was the home life of our dear Frankenstein? His father was a saint, his mother was a saint too, so was his fiancée Elizabeth, his beautiful young cousin, so was his friend Henry Clerval, a man light in spirit, an aerial, an idealised version of Shelley. The family are so relentlessly virtuous, they're intolerable. Mary evidently gave Frankenstein everything she had never known. Her father was William Godwin, author of the anarchist classic Political Justice, whose ruthless logic preached the perfectibility of man when governed by reason, and which advocated a society structured on reason, mass education, shared property, and minimal government. 
I cherished an excessive and romantic attachment to my father. She dedicated Frankenstein to him. Her own book is haunted by his novel, Caleb Williams, another novel of guilt, pursuit, the mutual dependence of hunter and hunted. From her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, author of the pioneering feminist text, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, came the fire that smoldered under Mary's ice. Mama. Mary Wollstonecraft was one of those beings who appear once, perhaps, in a generation to gild humanity with her rays. That mother had died giving birth to her. So this motherless child felt not only loss, but the guilt which haunts her novel. She was inwardly an exile, and at her mother's grave in June 1814, openly offered herself and her love to another and only love, I am thine, thine. Shelley, a brilliant poet, a burning spirit and a revolutionary intellect, a follower of Godwin and even more radical, atheist, republican, advocate of a totally free love, a hero to popular radicals, but a disconcerting man given to depressions, delusions, nightmares and an outcast from the university and from his noble family. In ceaseless pursuit of his personal grail, he seemed a man in endless flight, a sensation which suffused the life and the writings of his Mary. And when these two ran away together in July 1814, they fled as exiles seeking sanctuary. Every inconvenience was hailed as a new chapter in the romance of our travels. It was acting a novel, being an incarnate romance. Her book, Frankenstein, is steeped in experiences which she and Shelley shared. I have an affection for this hideous progeny of mine, for it was the offspring of happy days, when death and grief were words which found no true echo in my heart. It speaks of many a drive, Many a walk, many a conversation, when I was not alone. With Shelley, she spent two precarious but exhilarating years ranging a Europe ravaged by the Twenty Years' War against the French Revolution and Napoleon. And this was Shelley, the author of Prometheus Unbound, whose mind forever strained at the limits of the intellect and the imagination. Mary injects this spirit into her Frankenstein. She sends him to the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria. This was notorious as the home of the Illuminati, a revolutionary secret society which had resurrected the old Renaissance dream of a scientific magic. In the age of the French Revolution, when men seemed capable of changing the universe, a secularized version resurfaced. The Illuminati, steeped in it, worked through secret societies and Freemasonry to overthrow society, inaugurate a new age. Frankenstein, like Shelley, had dabbled in Rosicrucianism as a boy, but the reality of a science repelled him until he met a professor who accepted his early passion and transformed it. Ancients promised impossibilities and performed nothing. Modern masters promise very little. Their hands seem only made to dabble in dirt. But they penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. That day decided my destiny. To examine the causes of life, we must have recourse to death. Two years and more, cut off from humankind among the dead. If the study to which you apply yourself has a tendency to weaken your affections and to destroy your taste for simple pleasures, then that study is certainly unlawful. 
If no man allowed any pursuit whatsoever to interfere with the tranquility of his domestic affections, Greece had not been enslaved. Caesar would have spared his country. America would have been discovered more gradually. And the of A cry from the heart against men's abandonment of humanity in pursuit of power through knowledge from a woman whose commitment to natural emotions, to family, to ordinary domesticity grew stronger the more her own life with Shelley denied them. It became the germ of a powerful feminist critique of science itself as a male drive for objectivity, turning men inhuman as they turned nature into an object molding her, mauling her, to produce something monstrous. Light breaks in on me. I have discovered the course of life. A new species will bless me as its creator. I begin the creation of human being. Even after 200 years, this moment can still electrify and shock. Frankenstein has crossed the invisible frontier. He has usurped somebody's role. Whose? I dreamed that my first baby came to life again, that it had only been cold, and we rubbed it by the fire and it lived. At the age of 18, before she'd even reached Geneva, Mary had seen Clara, her first baby by Shelley, die in her arms, the living creature brought forth from her own body. In her novel, man through Frankenstein defies the rules of natural order, he usurps the role of woman. Many would say Frankenstein usurps the role of God, not Mary Shelley, hers is a godless book. She evokes Prometheus, the hero of every radical, the rebel god who stole fire from heaven and gave its life to humankind. In punishment, chained forever to a rock where vultures forever tear at his entrails. No vultures haunt Frankenstein's mind. He's had to make his creature huge to cope with detail. But like a good enlightenment man, he makes sure the parts are beautiful. If the parts are beautiful, must not the whole be? He brings his creature to life and finds it a monster. Terrified, he flees from it. He awakes to find his monster leering at him. He runs from his own creature through the dark streets. As dawn breaks, he careers exhausted into an oncoming coach. His friend Clerval, Ariel, coming to find him. The monster vanishes, but it is months before Frankenstein stops looking over his shoulder. It is then the first vulture strikes. Victor, your little brother William has been found murdered near Geneva. William, the most beautiful little blue-eyed fellow in the world. A chilling prophecy of the death of Mary's best-loved child, William. The world will never be to me again as it was. There was a life and freshness in it that was lost to me. It was I who ought to have died. In her book, Mary sends the distraught Frankenstein racing home to Geneva. Everyone in the book gathers in Geneva, just as Mary and her group of brilliant, wild and prickly friends gathered there in 1816. In that 1816, wealthy, dull, democratic old Geneva was suddenly ravaged by a terrifying alpine storm. And it is just such a storm which opens the next critical a section of her novel. <laughs> Frankenstein runs into it as he crosses the lake. But what's that? That gigantic form. It is he, the filthy demon to which I have given life. What does he hear? It is he who is the murderer. Nothing in 
human shape could have destroyed that fair child. He is right. His monster, abandoned and driven mad by human cruelty, had gone in search of his maker. He'd run into little William, at last a friend. But when he discovered the terrified boy was a Frankenstein, he killed him. And he left the boy's locket on the sleeping Justine, a peasant girl of noble character the Frankensteins had adopted. And Mary Shelley has Justine hanged for a crime she did not commit. But what of her poor wretch of a Frankenstein? She summons him to the burning, cleansing purity of the ice and the high places, which haunts her novel. Marian Shelley had come this way in 1816. The immensity of the Alps overwhelmed them and moved Shelley to poetry. The Mer de Glace, the sea of ice, a glacial torrent sweeping down from Mont Blanc. This place has hypnotized writers and artists. Turner painted here. Men had only recently climbed it, or to employ Frankenstein's idiom, conquered it. Nothing can be more desolate than the ascent of this mountain. The trees torn away by avalanches and intermingled with stones present the appearance of a vast and dreadful isolation. It is in this desolation that Mary brings Monster face to face with his maker. It is a memorable confrontation, for this is not the monster of Frankenstein films. Mary's monster speaks. I expected this reception. You, my creator, detest and spurn me. The creature to whom thou art bound by ties dissoluble only by the annihilation of one of us. I ought to be thy Adam. I am rather the fallen angel. I was benevolent. My soul glowed with humanity. Misery made me a fiend. Do your duty towards me, and to the rest of the world. Hear my tale. And Frankenstein listens. He expresses no surprise at his monster's fluency. Fluency? He can be as eloquent as a Welsh preacher with a hoil as he tells of how he emerged into the world, abandoned, alone. A strange multiplicity of sensations seized me. It was indeed a long time before I learned to distinguish between the operations of my various senses. He learns. He learns like one of Rousseau's children, born naked but with an instinct for goodness. Above all, he learns that humankind hates him as a monster. Ah! He flees in pain from the barbarity of man. He finds a secret family. They enchant him. Through them, he discovers music. By imitation, he painfully learns to speak their language, which is French. Their experience becomes his. They are joined by another of Mary's noble enlightenment women, Safi, a Christian Arab woman who escapes Muslim persecution to join her young lover. He teaches her his language from a book. And through them, the monster learns to read. The book was Volney's Ruins of Empires. What wonderful narrations. This man at once so virtuous, and yet so base. I could not conceive how one man could murder his fellow, or even why there were laws and government. I learnt of immense wealth and squalid poverty, of rank and descent. It could be William Godwin speaking. Volney's Ruins was a classic of the popular enlightenment that came out at the climax of the French Revolution. A sweeping a survey of the whole of human history, it demolishes all religions, preaches an anarchist, rationalist utopia. Like Shelley himself, a standard text for radical and working class movements for two generations and more. In the 1860s, a great uncle of mine used to teach Volney's ruins to his chartist, Sunday school in South Wales, gobbets and all. And this is the first book 
that this motherless child of nature reads. What a strange nature is knowledge. It clings to the mind like lichen to a rock. I wished sometimes to shake off all thought and feeling. The cry of a creature snatched from an instinctive world of feeling, the familiar, customary and comforting, into the hard, exhilarating, cruel, relentless world of the brain. An experience which leaves him an alien to both. An experience shared by many who are not monsters. I am solitary and detested. I learned there was but one means to overcome this pain, and that was death. 